Oh, there's some music playing. Oh, it's a recorder. Uh, I just wanted to start by giving you all uh, just some readouts of the meetings the Secretary has been having over the course of the last few days. There are quite a few, so bear with me. Uh, yesterday, uh, the Secretary met with uh, President Kabila of the DRC. Uh, they discussed their shared vision for a more prosperous DRC that can build on the progress achieved during the past year in bringing stability to the Great Lakes region. The Secretary and President Kabila affirmed their joint commitment to the continued demobilization and repatriation of the M23, of the former, sorry, M23 combatants, and ending the threat from the FDLR within the next six months through a continued process of voluntary demobilization backed by a credible military threat. The Secretary also expressed support for the DRC government's goal of establishing a more transparent international adoptions process but reiterated U.S. concerns about the humanitarian impact of the DRC government suspension of visa issuance for adopted children. Uh, during uh, his meeting with Vice President Fashente of Angola, the Secretary welcomed Angola's leadership in Africa and world affairs, particularly in the Great Lakes region. The United States considers Angola a key stakeholder in the peace, security, and cooperation framework peace process and strongly supports Angola's efforts in its role as chair of the International Conference on the Great Lakes Region to help resolve the conflict in the DRC. The Secretary also noted Angola's efforts on trafficking in persons through a recent recommitment to combat trafficking. And U.S.-UN Ambassador Powers uh, urge call, er, er, called for continued engagement on peacekeeping operations, both regionally and internationally. The Secretary... Hmm? I don't know what... How, uh, how, I don't know why I just said Powell. No, Long power. Day. Power, I know. Power, so. I know what her name is. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. Um, the Secretary called for the next iteration of the Sec Security and Economic Dialogue to be held in the fall. Uh, the Secretary also uh, met yesterday with Burundi President uh, Kurun Ziza. During this, their meeting, they discussed how to work together to build a peaceful, stable, and prosperous nation, including support to the Burundi government, law enforcement, judiciary, and military to develop the institutions and procedures that will protect citizens and establish a foundation for long-term national and regional stability. They also discussed the critical importance for Burundi's continued economic growth and stability for the 2016 national elections there to be peaceful, fair, free, and consistent with the spirit of the Arusha Accords. In support of these elections, they talked about the strong U.S. support for continued, robust United Nations presence in Burundi, including the current UN office in Burundi, which concludes in December, and the follow-on UN electoral Observ observation mission. Uh, he also met yesterday with uh, President Kumpure, Kumpure uh, of Burkina Faso. Secretary Kerry expressed uh, condolences to the families of the 28 citizens who are among the 116 passengers and crew who lost their lives uh, in the crash of the Air Algeri. Uh, fight uh, in Mali, flight in Mali, uh, just a few weeks ago. Secretary Kerry discussed the importance of developing strong institutions and peaceful transitions of power. He also expressed appreciation for Burkina Faso's contributions to the UN peacekeeping missions and regional mediation efforts, including support of the Mali peace negotiations recently begun in Algiers. And last one of yesterday, during an August 4th meet, during uh, the meeting yesterday on the margins of the Africa Leader Summit, Secretary Kerry congratulated. Uh, Mauritanian um, President Aziz on his recent re-election and for assuming the chairmanship of the African Union. The Secretary applauded him for his leadership role in negotiating a ceasefire between the Malian government and rebel groups in the country's north and recognized the strong U.S.-Mauritania partnership on counterterrorism initiatives uh, in the region. Uh, today, just a few from today, uh, the Secretary and Prime Minister Hali Maryam of Ethiopia discussed security in South Sudan and in the Horn of Africa. The Secretary commended Ethiopia for moving the South Sudan peace process forward and working to bring the two sides of the conflict together. The Secretary also commended Ethiopia for its contributions to fighting al-Shabaab and neighboring Somalia and for helping Somalia create a more just, peaceful, and democratic society. The Prime Minister remarked that regional peace and stability is the basis for economic growth and noted that Ethiopia is working very hard to bring investors to the region. The Secretary uh, finally underscored the U.S. commitment to help, continuing to help Ethiopia strengthen capacity in the fields of health, education, agriculture, energy, and democracy and human rights, noting that we provided Ethiopia $800 million in assistance annually. Uh, the Secretary also met uh, with uh, AU uh, Com Commission Chairper uh, Chairperson Zuma this morning. Uh, he expressed his sincere gratitude 
uh, to her for her work as chairperson of the African Union Commission. He reiterated that the African Union is a key strategic partner in implementing President Obama's uh, strate strategy for Sub-Saharan Africa, strengthening democratic institutions, spurring economic growth, trade and investment, advancing peace and security, and promoting opportunity and development. They discussed the potential positive role of the summit in changing perceptions in Africa, of Africa and the United States, highlighting opportunities in Africa for U.S. investment outside of the extractive industries. Finally, uh, the Secretary also met this morning with South Sudan President Kiir. The meeting came at a very critical time, especially given our concern about lack of progress in peace negotiations, ongoing violence, and a worsening humanitarian crisis, which we see as the worst food security situation in the world, now made worse by the recent killings of a number of humanitarian workers in South Sudan. Secretary Kerry and Ambassador Power expressed their concern about continued fighting and the growing humanitarian crisis, which will reach even more catastrophic levels in the coming months. The Secretary stressed that in order for a transitional government to be established, the parties need to come to the table and need a peace agreement. That is the summary of our bilateral meetings. <clears throat> Go ahead, Matt. Wow. Did he have time to do anything else? He has done a few other things in that time, it turns okay. out. Um, listen, can we start with uh, maybe some of them have been on the Middle East? Uh, have they it? have not, but no, we can certainly have. start with the All Middle right. East. All right. Well, listen, I, we saw your um, comments and the comments of the White House, uh, your comments last night, the comments of the White House about the ceasefire uh, and you being supportive of it and also being uh, supportive of the talks that are now going to mm -hmm. happen whenever they start in Cairo. Um, what is the administration's thinking about U.S. participation in these talks, if at all? And if the, the parties who are the direct parties to this are not particularly enthusiastic about U.S. participation, um, are you going to try to force your way, barge in to this, much in the same way the President and former Secretary of State did at the, with the Chinese and the climate talks in Copenhagen? Well, uh, that was uh, quite a unique event, uh, but um, this is a, an issue that, of course, the Secretary and senior levels of the administration have been closely involved in. We expect that will continue. In terms of who will participate, we're still determining uh, who and what, at what level. Obviously, we're in discussions uh, not only internally, but with the Israelis and the Egyptians about that as well. But so you do... Yeah. Uh, you, you our expectation is that we will continue to remain closely engaged uh, in terms of who and how and when we're still determining but, that. But, but you have decided that U.S. participation in these talks in Cairo is important and should happen, correct? I think it is likely we will be participating you, in these talks. We, will, we are determining at what level and in what capacity can, and when. Can you say if you are, feel, uh, if the administration feels that its participation is welcome? I think uh, our effort and our engagement on this process from the beginning um, has been uh, welcomed by the parties. Um, we've been, we were in Egypt. Really? We just, spent, we just spent an entire like 10 day period where both sides were telling you the exact opposite. Well, I think, Matt, there is sometimes a difference between what is stated publicly and what uh -huh. is communicated privately. Um, in this case, as we know, this ceasefire just took hold this morning. Uh, obviously, um, in over the course of the last uh, 10 days or more, uh, the Secretary has been uh, very closely engaged, uh, making more than 100 phone calls related to the ceasefire. We all know he spent five days in Cairo, a day in Paris, uh, a day in Israel. The President has spoken with Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, three times over the course of the last uh, few weeks as well. So, obviously, we want to see a ceasefire that will be prolonged, that will hold, um, that will give an opportunity to have negotiations, um, but uh, there are, of course, um, uh, you know, where we are now is determining uh, our engagement did, moving did forward. The, did the U.S. government have any direct role in achieving the ceasefire that has now taken hold? Well, uh, absolutely, Arshad. I think our engagement over the past 10 days has built and led to the point we reached last night. And that's why I referenced the number of calls and the number of visits the Secretary was engaged in. I think there are two important factors um, that obviously have changed over the course of the last couple of days, and uh, or two conditions, I should say. One of them is that Israel uh, completed work um, on uh, the tunnels. Uh, at their insistence, of course, uh, the ceasefire agreed to last week allowed for Israel to continue that work. That's something the United States supported. Of course, that obviously made it more difficult to sustain a ceasefire, um, given 
uh, sometimes the confusion that causes on the ground. And the second factor is, of course, uh, that um, there's growing concern and pressure that has built over the course of the last 10 days, in part due to the Secretary's involvement uh, from the international community. Um, that has, there's uh, been a building course of uh, support for a ceasefire, uh, obviously to see an end to the rocket attacks, but also to see an end to the humanitarian crisis that we've seen on the ground in Gaza. How, I mean, there were at least two ceasefires that were, uh, well, there was definitely one that was more or less announced uh, uh, in the middle of the night in uh, India mm -hmm. that did not take hold. Um, and then there was it a... It took hold briefly, but yes. Yeah, excuse me. It took hold for 90 minutes or whatever was the number mm -hmm. of minutes. But I think if it's a ceasefire lasts for less than two hours, it's, you know, whether it actually took hold or not is, is, is kind of debatable. Uh, but in any case, it didn't succeed. Uh, similarly, the prior ceasefire, uh, which was originally 12 hours and then may be extended, did not end up lasting mm -hmm. a long time. And <clears throat> what I'm trying to understand is what was the direct U.S. role in the last, say, 48 hours, because from the outside it kind of looks like the Israelis simply decided that they had done what they needed to do and therefore they had decided to stop. So what, what was your role in the last, say, 48 hours well, on in the, the current ceasefire? Well, in the last 48 fire? hours, the Secretary has continued to be closely engaged with Prime Minister Netanyahu, with Egyptian Foreign Minister Shukri, with all of the parties. The point I was trying to make, Arshad, is that obviously the work of the last 10 days, built by the Secretary, by the UN, by a range of international partners, built to the point we reach now. But there are conditions that, of course, changed over the course of time, including the fact that Israel completed their work by their own uh, public statements on the tunnels. Not only does that uh, create more of a condition, perhaps, to have a sustainable ceasefire, it also, of course, um, you know, gives the people of Israel more security that that piece of the job is done. Um, so that certainly is a factor in terms of the, con the conditions of how we got to this point. Um, and then the second piece is, you know, over the course of the last 10 days, um, and even the last 48 hours. There's been continued building international support for a ceasefire, concern about the uh, civilian casualties we're seeing, concern about the ongoing uh, rocket fire, and those are all factors that have contributed to the point we led to last night. One, one other one on this. Mm -hmm. um, there is, and I know you're not responsible for what op-ed writers uh, write, but there is a, a, a piece by David Ignatius today that lays out what purports to be Secretary Kerry's ideas for uh, the next steps. Um, and it talks about a circumstance under which you would try to strengthen President Abbas. There would be a transfer of the border control on the Palestinian side to PA forces, both on the Israeli and the Egyptian side. It talks about disarming Hamas. But what it doesn't talk about and what I don't understand, and again, I know this is just somebody's op-ed piece, mm -hmm. but it, it doesn't explain at all why Hamas would be interested in in doing any of these things or in seeing any of these things happen in in Gaza. D does that piece reflect the sector's thinking? And if so, uh, how do you hope to get Hamas to agree to do all these things that one would think w it would be quite opposed to? Well, um, let me first say there's no um, carry plan. I'll put that in quotes. Um, there are, um, there, there has, he has been, uh, has long supported um, an effort to strengthen President Abbas and to work with um, other parties in the region to do just that. And uh, that will continue. Um, so that certainly is supportive of his view. Uh, the reason why the negotiations are so important is because these are issues uh, that we believe and he believes need to be worked out in Cairo uh, with the, the hosts, the Egyptian hosts. Uh, certainly with our support, but uh, the issue of how, a de how demilitarization would work, which we certainly support, or how um, efforts to open up greater economic opportunity to the people of Gaza, um, those are issues that need to be discussed uh, between the parties. Um, Jen, just a couple very quick points. Mm -hmm. You mentioned, you said uh, over the past 48 hours, the Secretary has been actively engaged talking with Prime Minister Netanyahu, the Egyptian Foreign Minister, and others. But unless something else, but I thought you answered my, you answered earlier by saying he hadn't been in touch with Prime Minister Netanyahu 
over the last day. Well, he was it, in touch with him on Sunday. Right, and what you said was the very brief phone call mm -hmm. interrupted by some communications problem. And so, but okay, so if we go back 48 hours mm -hmm. from right now, which is almost 3 o'clock I'm going to give Tuesday. you a rundown of the calls he's yeah. made. Yeah. Uh, he spoke, uh, he's spoken today, I would remind you since you asked me, since he's had 12 bilats, he hasn't had as much quality right. phone time as perhaps he would like, but uh, he spoke with um, Secretary, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon today. He also spoke um, with um, Egyptian Foreign Minister Shukri yesterday. He spoke with Special Coordinator for the UN Robert Seri yesterday. Uh, so those are just the calls that he's done over the okay, last few days. As far as you know, he hasn't managed to reconnect with Prime Minister Netanyahu. Mm -hmm. Since Not the, over the last 36 right. hours. No. All right. And then um, <clears throat> you said that uh, uh, there is no carry plan, quote unquote. But is what was notable in the in the Washington Post piece, what, at least something that jumped out at me, was that there there wasn't any method or um, well, you say that it that, that the general goals outlined there are what the secretary has been pushing for for months now, mm -hmm. um, but. Is the administration convinced that Hamas has to disarm? Because whether, and, and, and if it is, how exactly does that happen? Because it doesn't seem to be addressed in, in, in that piece. Well, I don't know that that piece was meant to be a rollout document or of any sort, certainly not officially from the government. But um, demilitarization, the point I was making, is something we certainly support. How we get there is a good question. There are what a lot of parties that will have that discussion. There are also pieces, this is just the last thing I'd say, there are also um, um, pr priorities that um, the Palestinians um, have, uh, including opening up uh, some of the crossings, like Rafah Crossing, uh, more access to goods, economic opportunity. Uh, that are some of their asks in this discussion. So obviously, just like in any negotiation, there are pieces that both sides are interested in. But is disarmament or demilitarization, is that critical to these talks in Egypt? Well, it's critical in the sense that it's a big priority for the Israelis, and obviously they are an important party in the discussions. Right. But, I mean, is that something that you think must be addressed in these negotiations? I don't think we're going to be dictating right. what terms they will be, but certainly we understand why it needs to be part of the discussion. And then my last one is just that I want to get an answer. If you're not welcome at these, if you, meaning the administration, is not welcome at these talks, are you going to insist, are you going to force your way into them? I don't, I don't think we anticipate that at this point in time, Matt, so. So what happens on Friday, 1 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. local, when mm -hmm. the ceasefire is supposed to be done? Well, Roz, I think obviously one of the fact, one of the priorities or one of the, the um, focuses early in any discussions will have to be an extension of the ceasefire so that there can be a longer period of time uh, to uh, continue the negotiations. And we don't expect that these very difficult, complicated issues with a great deal of history will be resolved in a matter of hours. Is uh, the Special Envoy, Mr. Lowenstein, working the phones? Uh, certainly. He just returned uh, last yesterday, um, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, he certainly would be one of the individuals who could return uh, to Egypt, and he certainly has been engaged on the phone. I expect that will continue. More on this issue? Uh, or on Gaza? Yes, one more Okay. Uh, this issue will be coming next month at the United Nations uh, General Assembly uh, gatherings. Uh, and what do you think the UN or the international community will play a role as, a, as far as the permanent ceasefire is concerned? Well, the UN has been an important partner with the United States and many in the international community in supporting a ceasefire. Uh, and we expect that will continue. Obviously, one of the people that Secretary Kerry has spoken with in the limited time he's had over the past 24 hours is Robert Seri, and he was closely engaged with him uh, throughout the course of the last several days. Do we have any more in Gaza? Can you go back um, to the allegations, primarily against the Israeli military, but uh, also against Hamas, of uh, civilian casualties, some using language such as genocide, human rights violations. The U.S. has expressed its concern over the way that uh, some of the Israeli military's uh, actions were conducted uh, during this operation, and I note your colleague at the White House did so very pointedly last <clears throat> Thursday. What is being done in terms of accountability since it seems that the fighting has stopped, and accountability for both sides? 
Well, Roz, I think um, one, uh, the point we were we made with our public statements from the State Department as well is that uh, while we certainly uh, respect Israel's right to defend themselves, uh, there's certainly more that could be done or could have been done uh, to prevent and avoid civilian casualties. That's the case in any war zone. Uh, and I know, and this may be what you're referring to, that there are reports of um, a push for an ICC investigation. Our view mm -hmm. is that, uh, you know, we continue to strongly oppose unilateral actions that seek to circumvent or prejudge uh, the very outcome, outcomes that can only be negotiated. Uh, we've been very clear um, that um, while uh, we've expressed concerns when we've had them, uh, there is the only realistic path for realizing Palestinian aspirations of statehood is through direct negotiations between the parties. Obviously, our focus right now uh, continues to be on addressing this current situation. Uh, so, go ahead. Walk. Does that mean that uh, as part of whatever these talks will be that the question of overreach, atrocities, whatever word that you want to use from both sides would be addressed in I that venue as opposed to That wasn't what I was ICC. saying at all, at all, Roz. What I was saying, I think we know what the issues will be, which are the issues that were presented by both sides. Uh, that would be the focus of the negotiations, whether that's security for Israel or that's economic opportunity. Uh, for the Palestinian side. Well, I guess well, I guess what I'm asking, with just sorry, Matt, I guess what I'm asking is, things happened in the last 29 days, and there are going to be people on both sides expecting some sort of resolution of what happened. How will that be done? Well, uh, I, right now our focus is on uh, seeing if the ceasefire can be extended, seeing if these core issues can be, these key issues can be addressed. Uh, the question of uh, what the UN Security Council might do uh, will be evaluated at a later time. I don't understand how you are concerned about an ICC investigation prejudging the outcome of final negotiations, unless you are saying that the potential or possibility of war crimes having been committed is going to now be part of the peace process, in which case, you know. I think the, That's not what I was saying. Are, what, I think what, the reason okay, I so use that broad reference is because there have been, uh, this is not the first time there have been rumors of, certainly there have been issues raised in the past, um, and we think there's a, other forums to address them. Right. Why, but, why, but, shouldn't, why shouldn't, just in the interest of justice, why shouldn't allegations of war crimes in any conflict be addressed in some forum? Why, I, why I not? wasn't saying that in any broad... I wasn't making a broad point that it shouldn't be rushed. I Just think not at our the focus, ICC? our focus right now, is on addressing the current situation. Why shouldn't an allegation of war crimes by any side in any conflict be addressed at the ICC? Why is that a bad forum? Why, why shouldn't that happen? I, we, as you know, there have been occasions where we have uh, been supportive of that. So, but my question is, why not now? I, I think mean, there's going to be a great deal of time to make a determination about what happened and what issues should be raised at uh, a higher level. Uh, but right now, we think the focus should be on addressing the current situation. But but why? I mean, you know, I understand the underlying argument. Mm -hmm. I think, which is that if the Palestinians seek to join the Rome Statute or to sign on to it, and then you know, and then raise it, that that is a unilateral action mm -hmm. that you believe prejudices the outcome. Correct. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't understand why, leaving aside that one piece of it, why the government of the United States of America would not argue that if there are credible allegations of war crimes, and there are certainly things which you, in your name, said were disgraceful and that the U.S. government was appalled by them, uh, why it should not support an independent investigation into what happened. I think we're not at that point right now, Arshad, and I certainly didn't in any statement call anything a war crime. Obviously, there'll be a great deal of time to determine what happened and what steps should be taken. That's not our current focus at this moment. I guess there, there, is, another, <clears throat> there is another route to the ICC, and that's to the UN Security Council. Can we assume that the administration would veto any, uh, that the U.S. would veto any move at the Security Council to, to bring not just whatever Israel is alleged to do, but what Hamas is alleged to do as well. To, to, is that would that be a fair assumption? I'm just there hasn't even been a UN Security Council right. resolution proposed. Well, so the, I don't oh, think so I'm going to go there far, at this point. Thus time. far, in this conflict, which is now stopped because of the ceasefire, mm -hmm. there has been a total of 
one vote on any kind of an investigation into it, and you guys voted against it because you said it was one-sided. understand. <clears throat> I'm aware. So, but you're not saying that you're opposed to any investigation at I, all, as long as it's I, I as have, long as I have no comments <coughs> on this, no evaluation of it. Okay. We will determine at a later date <coughs> what the appropriate steps are. Uh, <coughs> new topic, or go ahead. Yeah, on Lebanon. Uh, mm -hmm. if, 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 go ahead, if you want. You, you'll take Lebanon or Asia? Sure, I'll do Lebanon and then. Okay. Okay. You wouldn't want to see the Palestinian Authority go back into Gaza to help clear the area of illegal weapons, is that it? I think, Lucas, there's a, a great deal that needs to be discussed in terms of what is going to happen from here. A lot of those discussions will happen in Cairo. I'm not going to prejudge what the steps will be, when they'll be, uh, anything beyond that. But aren't there already outstanding treaties that say, like Oslo, for example, from 1995, saying that there should not be any illegal weapons throughout Gaza? Well, I think there are a lot of issues that need to be addressed in Gaza that uh, will be a part of the discussions moving forward. Lucas, go uh, ahead. Lebanon, to what extent are you concerned about the clashes between the Lebanese army and the ISIL in Assal at the border with uh, Syria? And uh, are you providing any uh, arms and any help to the Lebanese uh, forces? Well, um, I think we put out a statement just a few days ago on this, uh, Michelle. But, um, I will say I can give you an update on what we are providing. Uh, as you know, we provide significant security assistance, um, and we are currently providing uh, $75 million in support to Lebanon's armed forces uh, just in FY 2014 alone. Uh, this assistant is, assistance is intended to bolster uh, the efforts to preserve Lebanese security and stability, including minimizing the spillover violence from the Syrian crisis that is impacting Lebanon. Uh, our support for the Lebanese army uh, also, uh, of course, a key institution of Lebanese statehood is critical, and the spillover effects of the Syrian crisis have increased the strain, as we all know, hence why you're asking, uh, and we remain fully committed. Um, in FY 2015, our request uh, includes $80 million for FMF security assistance for Lebanon. Uh, the um, administration's $5 billion counterterrorism partnership fund request includes funds specifically to help mitigate the spillover effects uh, for Lebanon. And as we uh, look to the future, we'll continue to assess, of course, uh, how we can uh, best assist. And are you planning to provide the Lebanese army with uh, sophisticated uh, arms since th uh, they are fighting ISIL in a uh, complicated uh, area? Well, I think uh, our assistance includes what I've just outlined. I have nothing to predict for you in terms of future assistance. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, in, in the region. I just wondered if uh, the State Department has any new information or any um, updated comment on the case of the a Washington Post correspondent, Jason Rezaian, and his wife, Yagana Salahe, uh, who were detained on July 22nd and have not been heard from. Uh, particularly, uh, there was a report yesterday uncorroborated by Iran Wire that um, the caretaker for their building uh, was killed at the time of their uh, detention for uh, asking uh, for documentation and an arrest warrant uh, from whoever it was who, who, who grabbed them. Mm -hmm. Do you have any um, information that might substantiate or refute that report? Um, unfortunately, we don't have a great deal of information, so let me share with you what we have. Um, we, of course, have seen the reports um, that an individual uh, in Mr. Rosine's building died from injuries sustained, the reports you referenced. Uh, we don't have any uh, further information or confirmation of those reports. Uh, we remain concerned about uh, his detention in Iran along with uh, one other U.S. citizen and uh, the non-U.S. citizen spouse of one of the two, uh, one of which you referenced. Um, we, of course, call on the Iranian government and continue to call on the Iranian government to immediately release uh, him and the other individuals. Our focus is on doing everything possible to secure the safe return and release of Mr. Rezaian and the others detained with him. We have requested consular access via our protecting power, Switzerland, uh, in general. However, uh, Iran's response to our request for consular access to dual U.S. and Iranian citizens is that Iran does not recognize their U.S. citizenship and considers them to be solely Iranian citizens. I don't have any specific update at this point in time in our request. Uh, but we, of course, continue to monitor the situation very closely. Um, just, just a quick clarification on that. Um, you said that's the the Iranian's position generally. Has it, generally it, been with the it, other American citizens, right? Yes. But they, it, do I, in, 
take it from that and what what you said after that they have not given the Swiss any specific there's no specific yes no update yet. in this okay. case right. yes Got it. do you know whether the Swiss have been able to see Jason and his wife at all there's no specific update in the case no specific update or, no, or there's been no response from the Iranians to the Swiss request no specific update I can provide to all of you okay it, uh, Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, uh, one on our own. Sorry, we're, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Can you confirm a report that the State Department had a meeting with former comfort women from South Korea last week? And if that's the case, uh, could you share who met from the State Department and who requested this meeting? Uh, well, at their request, two members of the House of Sharing met State Department officials on July 31st and discussed their experiences. It's important to note that State Department officials have periodically met with members of the House of Sharing in the past. Uh, so this is not the first time or it's not without precedent. Um, I don't have any uh, other updates on, um, on the level. Uh, of course, it was here in Washington, so from our bureau here. So you don't know if it's requested from South Korean they government? No, it was requested from the uh, members of the uh, House of Sharing. Okay. Um, do you have any concern this kind of meeting? might have a negative impact on U.S.-Japan relationship, given Japan has a dis dis different opinions on these um, issues. Well, I think this is an issue that we have discussed um, certainly in the past uh, with Japan. Um, as we've stated uh, many times, um, it, it is deplorable and clearly a grave human rights <laughs> violation of enormous proportions that the Japanese military was involved in the trafficking of women for sexual purposes in the 1930s and 1940s. Um, and uh, we, as we know, that was uh, quite a long time ago, but we encourage Japan to continue to address this issue in a manner that promotes healing and <coughs> facilitates better relations with neighboring states. Uh, we have had meetings, uh, State Department officials have periodically met with representatives from this group in the past, uh, so it uh, shouldn't set a new precedent, and obviously there's a great deal we work with Japan on. So, last question, so you uh -huh. don't rule out any future meeting like this? I don't think I'm ruling it out. I think we meet periodically with representatives from this group. Well, I think uh, the uh, EAP would be the national. Not DRL. Uh, I'd have to check on that actually, but uh, I, it wasn't at a. It was a working level meeting. So. Right. I'm just curious as to what bureau or multiple. Maybe there were multiple. I will. I will see if there's more clarity we'd like to provide. So you don't have any content of the meeting. So I'm sorry. With more detail of the meeting, you don't have. Any I don't think I'm going to have more detail to provide now. Mm -hmm. How can you? in good faith negotiate with the Iranian government over their nuclear program when they're taking American hostages? Well, uh, Lucas, let me say first that the reason that we're working with the P5 plus one uh, members, uh, the reason why we've been negotiating with Iran is because of the great concern the President, many members of Congress, the Secretary of State have about uh, Iran acquiring a nuclear weapon. And uh, we think preventing that is a, not just a priority for the United States, but for the international community. At, every point in this process, we've had remaining concerns about other issues where we have strong disagreements, not just uh, the detaining of uh, American citizens, which of course um, is something we have uh, strong concern about, but uh, also issues like human rights violations and uh, their uh, work uh, and support for terrorist activities. But preventing Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon remains uh, an objective and a goal we think is worthy and one that uh, we uh, will, of course, continue to pursue. So as all of the, as these events transpire, would you say Iran is, is a, a good negotiating partner? Well, I think uh, Iran has abided by uh, the JPOA. Obviously, we're in, <coughs> moving into a new stage of negotiations that will begin soon. Um, as you know, uh, in each of uh, these negotiations, uh, whenever we have the opportunity, we raise concerns about the American citizens who have been detained and our desire to see them return home. Speaking of the nuclear talks, there are reports that there might be a sideline meeting at UNGA next month on the uh, negotiations. Can you confirm that? I've seen those reports. I don't have any update on uh, the timing of the next meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. Do we, do we have any more on Iran? Okay, go ahead, Egypt. Yes, please. Uh, the first one is uh, an American F FMO, MFO soldier was shot in Sinai. Do you have any information or update about him? Well, I know there were reports, but the media reports are incorrect. Uh, the MFO camp was not targeted during this incident. No U.S. soldier were injured. A uh, U.S. contractor was slightly injured uh, as a result of a stray round fired in the vicinity. Uh, the U.S. contractor has received treatment was released and has since returned 
uh, to duty. Okay, the second question regarding the Secretary Kerry yesterday met, uh, yesterday evening met uh, the Prime Minister of Egypt. Do you have any readout of the meeting? I believe I do. If I don't, I was there and I will give you a readout. Um, <clears throat> I'll just say that um, he had a meeting, as you mentioned, with the Prime Minister of Egypt uh, last evening. It was his last of the day. Uh, they discussed uh, not only our strategic and security relationship with Egypt uh, and the path forward, um, but also uh, steps that Egypt uh, could take to continue on the path to democracy. Uh, that's something the Secretary, of course, raises uh, during every meeting. Uh, he also raised the issue, again, of uh, the uh, arbitrary arrests and um, you know, our concern about uh, that uh, and the concern he hears from members of Congress about that as well. Uh, case, did that come up? Uh, it, it was a more of a general conversation. He t t did raise that as recently as the last time yep. he was there. How long was the meeting? I mean, I if I remember, it was about 30 minutes. These okay. meetings are never as long as you want them to be because they're all trying to fit in so many. So there is another question. One of the main issues of, I mean, yesterday the secretary had meetings and other people had meetings is all related to Libya. Mm -hmm. what, what's the main, what is your understanding now of what's going in Libya and how it's going to be somehow solved or find a, out? exit to this situation now? Well, uh, the Secretary also uh, met with the Prime Minister of Libya yesterday. Um, we continue to call uh, on all Libyans to respect the June election of the Council of Representatives to support the work of the Constitutional Drafting Assembly and to reject the use of violence. Uh, Libya's challenges can only be resolved by Libyans working together to secure a more stable and prosperous future, and we continue to stand solidly uh, by the Libyan people as they endeavor to do so. And certainly Libya, and actually it was certainly an issue I should have mentioned that, that was discussed last night during the meeting. It's been discussed in uh, some of his meetings uh, over the course of the last several days. As you know, there's we've been working with the international community to uh, try to address the security issues on the ground. We know this is, inher this is inherently a political problem, uh, but certainly uh, we have remaining security concerns that we're trying to work to address as well. Go ahead, Arshad your ability to work with the Libyan government on such things as <clears throat> um, uh, training and establishing uh, a security force that would be answerable to the Libyan government um, that uh, the U.S. has had to or has withdrawn uh, its diplomats from, from uh, Tripoli? Well, I think, um, one, it's important to note that this is a temporary uh, relocation. Uh, Ambassador Jones was in the meeting yesterday. She's remained closely engaged with the Libyans. And as you know, this is not just a United States um, endeavor. It is uh, one that we're working with the international community on. And uh, so those conversations are continuing at a high level. Our preference would certainly be to have our staff there, but we've been able to continue to engage and work uh, on these issues, both with the Libyans as well as uh, others in the international community who are closely engaged with it. Does, does it make it harder not being there? Uh, I think, uh, again, because a lot of these conversations and coordination are happening at a very high level, whether it's Ambassador <coughs> Satterfield, uh, Ambassador uh, Jones, uh, those are continuing. Um, but of course it's preferable and uh, to have our team on the ground and our full team on the ground, and that's certainly what we'd like to return to. Who's working on the issue of trying to uh for lack of a better word, demilitarize Libya. Well, who who from the State Department? Uh, well, just in general, uh, what parties are working on it? Are there any protocols that can be looked to to try to uh, make, you know, to help the government uh, secure the country so that people don't have to get caught in between these militias fighting? Well, I think um, there are a great deal of international efforts. Um, the Secretary has been engaged in a number of um, meetings uh, with a number of other countries that the, the, Brit uh, the UK has hosted, others have hosted, to discuss exactly that issue. I think it hasn't moved as quickly as we would like, Roz, but you know, obviously Ambassador Satterfield, um, uh, certainly Ambassador Jones, others who are engaged at a very high level here, uh, that's one of the primary issues that they're working on. Are Ambassador Jones and Ambassador Satterfield are in the same place or different places? Well, Ambassador Jones is the ambassador yeah. to 
Uh, Libya, she was. He, the ambassador she, fees, I think, is a special envoy. She correct, and he's been working uh, sort of as a uh, in in coordination with other uh, international partners on on kind of how to coordinate uh, as we work to address the issues going on in the Libya. The other question you said, Libyans. I mean, are you in touch with all the factions of or the fighting, whatever you call it? I don't know. It's groups, or or just the central government. Uh, I don't have a list of uh, our engagements. We can see if there's uh, one we can get to all of you if you'd like. Should we move on to a new issue? Michelle, go ahead. In the Middle East, that uh, the U.S. Uh, was behind the creation of ISIL in the region. and uh, Behind the creation? The creation or supporting the ISIL. And uh, they say that uh, since the U.S. didn't attack yet or so far ISIL in uh, some parts of Iraq uh, after they took over uh, some parts of Iraq. That's why the U.S. is behind the creation and supporting the ISIL. What can you say about that? Well, that's a ludicrous and absolutely false uh, accusation or view. Uh, our view is that uh, ISIL is a group of vicious terrorists. Uh, their campaign of terror and grotesque violence and repressive ideology poses serious threats to the stability and future of Iraq. Uh, we've seen uh, the nature of ISIL fully exposed uh, by its ruthless attacks on not only the Iraqi people but the Syrian people. Um, this is an issue that uh, not only the Secretary but the President of the United States remains focused on, and I think our actions speak to how concerned we are about ISIL. And wh why uh, the U.S. didn't react or didn't attack ISIL in Iraq and Syria so far? Why did we not attack? Yeah. Well, as you know, there are a couple of factors, including uh, the assessment on the ground, uh, that, of course, DOD has the lead on. Uh, we have uh, sent additional resources and had, they have been there for weeks. The other is uh, government formation. And uh, we believe, and the Secretary believes, and the senior members of the administration believe that government formation is an incredibly important part of uh, what needs to happen in Iraq uh, in order to proceed. Uh, and that, of course, is a factor in our own decision making. I mean, it's well and good for you to say it's ludicrous and absurd that you're that you created ISIL, or, or, but I think the perception that Michelle's talking about is that you have unintentionally given this group, not given is the wrong word, but this has armed this group to some extent because of the stuff that they've stolen from the Iraqi military. Is that, I mean, you don't, you don't deny that, do you? We've all seen I mean, the they, same they, reports. Right. Matt. I mean, they've taken this you know, uh, Humvees and, and other stuff and, 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 and arms, correct? You don't dispute that, right? So I guess the, the question is, why doesn't the U.S. <clears throat> destroy that stuff? Why don't we retroactively destroy it? No, them? why don't you go in now and take out, destroy the U.S. equipment that this group is now using against your, your, your friends, the Iraqi uh, army and the Peshmerga? I'm just not going to do a analysis from analysis. here on uh, what we should take, uh, what steps militarily. We okay, will but I think that take. that's kind of, that that may be something that's you know keeping okay, well, this this the point perception I'm making alive. Is obviously, that's an inaccurate perception. Yes, regarding the ISIL. A few weeks ago, you were mentioning that there was kind of a confrontation going on in the tweetosphere, as you can call it, between tweets that. So, is there this thing is still going on, or, or is they, you stopped it? Uh, I think a few weeks ago I spoke to our efforts to combat that. I don't have any real updates since then, um, in, in terms of their act, the activity of uh, ISIL's Twitter account. I, I would let you do analysis on that. Uh, do we have a new topic? New. Oh, go ahead in the back. Go ahead. Venezuela. Last sure. week there was an initial announcement from the State Department that the U.S. was considering punitive actions against um, some Venezuelan officials for human rights violations. Is there any more that you have on that? We've heard reports that um, the U.S. is moving to revoke the visas of 24 officials. So uh, the announcement that was made last week, um, obviously since then and, and in conjunction with that, there have been briefings with the Hill and there have been a range of uh, information that's been out there in the public domain. And so therefore we can <coughs> confirm that there are 24 individuals who will have restrictions imposed on them. Obviously those vary. 
um, but uh, that is a number we can confirm at this point in time. So, the gentleman in Venezuela? Uh, quick question. No. Uh, uh, on Venezuela? Think, Venezuela, go ahead. No, I don't have one on okay. Venezuela. Okay, go ahead. All right, I, I want to go to Ukraine. Okay. Um, one, I'm wondering if you were... Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, sorry I'm about that. <laughs> Yesterday, you said that you weren't able to verify either of these conflict, you know, the many numerous conflicting reports about these. I, I do have soldiers. a little bit of new information yeah. on do that. Do you have this? Um, the OSCE observer mission on the Russian border facilitated the movement of 437 Ukrainian troops into Russia on August 3rd. Uh, the troops had requested OSCE assistance. Uh, in opening a humanitarian corridor after being surrounded by separatists and finding themselves without food, fuel, and ammunition. All their attempts to negotiate a ceasefire with the separatists had failed. At least 192 of these uh, servicemen uh, returned to Ukraine on August 4th. Uh, the OSCE was not made aware of any asylum requests. Uh, we also uh, would note that the Russians have committed to return the rest of the troops as well. That's the latest number okay. that we have at this point. I mean, this is, situation seems bizarre no I'm I, I just want I mean so you have a situation where the Ukrainian army that you support is fighting separatists who you oppose but who are supported by Russia and somehow the OSCE negotiates safe passage for these Ukrainian troops into Russia where they are uh, not molested they're taken care of apparently and then they, and then some of them go back. This would seem to me to suggest that the situation is made perhaps less uh, recognizing that there is recognizing that there is actual shelling and, and fighting going on in certain places. I, what, what does this tell you about the situation between Ukrainian troops and the Russian troops on the other side of the border? Does it tell you anything? Uh, I'm not sure I would venture to do any broad analysis here, given the other events <coughs> that continue to happen Fair on enough. the ground. Um, obviously, in this case, um, the OSCE obviously played a significant role here in assuring their safe passage, and of cer certainly we wanted to note that the Russians have agreed to return the troops. Okay, so that's a positive thing? Uh, this particular incident, right. certainly, you, but obviously there are a range of other issues that we remain concerned about. Clearly, uh, I think you've, yes, you've made that uh, very obvious. But if you, do you think that it, in the absence, if the OSCE hadn't been there, are you concerned that there might have been, a, that this might have led to well, it's, you know, people dying, bloodshed. It's hard to know, Matt, but I mean, it, it was a situation, obviously, where um, they were surrounded by separatists and they had <coughs> no food, fuel, right. ammunition. So it certainly was not a desirable position, situation to be sitting in. Okay, so your position would be then that they should this should never have happened in the first place because there shouldn't be any separatists attacking the. Well, Army. certainly, the prime, the of course, primary point right. is that, yes. So the other thing that you, you were asked yesterday about this Russian military, aviation military exercise that's going mm -hmm. on, you said you were, the U.S. was very deep, was, was deeply concerned about it, that it's provocative. Um, well, the Russian Defense Ministry says that this, is, this exercise is not taking place really close to the Ukrainian border. It's a thousand kilometers away. Uh, and I'm wondering if, given, given that, if you're, you still have deep concerns about this being a provocative exercise. Well, I think, Matt, the point I was making yesterday that I think I would certainly stick with is that obviously the conditions and the circumstances that any of these exercises are taking place in are a relevant factor and that, uh, you know, when we're in a situation where we're trying to reach a ceasefire where the Russians say they want to reach that, these sort of exercises send a different message. Right. But, I mean, it's really not close to the Ukrainian border. So if you're deeply concerned, I mean, how far away can the Russians do military exercises without drawing the concern of the United States? I mean, do they have to be in Vladivostok? I mean, how far, how far away from? I mean, I mean, it, I don't I mean, have an exact I, kilometer. Uh, uh, Siberia. Where do they? Where? Where? Where exactly is it that the Russians can have military exercises that won't that you? don't think or that you won't have concerns are provocative to the situation in Ukraine. If there are exercises in Siberia, I'm happy to speak to that at the time. Uh, okay, but you still have you have concerns about this exercise and it being a pro provocative action, is that correct? Yes. Despite the distance, yes. the rather large distance. Mm -hmm. okay. um, Jen, the Polish foreign minister is very concerned about these exercises mm -hmm. and says that 
uh, Russia is preparing to invade Ukraine, and, and that has generated a lot of news. The markets are, are way down today. Uh, do you have any comment on that? Well, I think there have been a range of reports and comments out, out there. I think it's there are a few things that we do know. Um, additional Russian forces continue to uh, arrive along the Ukrainian border, uh, and Russia continues to reposition forces throughout the region. Um, we don't have specific numbers from here uh, to to share, um, and def troop, you know specifics on troop numbers is difficult to calculate. So I'm not going to make a prediction from here, but certainly the uh, the um, you know, the fact that troops continue to arrive is something that we uh, are watching closely and remain concerned about. And a few hours ago, uh, President Putin said that he was going to uh, develop a response to the sanctions put on his country by the United States and the EU, and that's also helped the stock market uh, is down 1 percent as we speak. I thought these sanctions were supposed to hurt Russia, not the United States. Well, I think, um, one, uh, Lucas, I think that the uh, vast, vast, vast majority of the hurt is being felt by Russia. Um, you know, as you noted, or I don't think, but re related to it, um, is the central bank's uh, statement and Russia that was made as well. I mean, our goal here remains continuing to impose costs uh, to increase uh, the in to impose sanctions to increase the costs and on Russia and on and to have an impact on Russia's actions. And obviously, with everything from uh, the amount of uh, nearly $100 billion of in capital is expected, expected to leave Russia, the impact on the energy, financial, uh, and defense sectors, they're all feeling pain. Um, and that's, uh, of course, what we are, are hopeful will have an impact. But you say you want to uh, affect Putin's actions, but you just said that Russia is putting more forces along the border. So how are the sanctions uh, making him change his calculus? Well, I think uh, with every week that passes, we're seeing more of the dire impact on the Russian economy. And obviously, President Putin has a choice to make. Does he uh, care about the uh, economy and the, the middle class people and people living in Russia? Or does he uh, care about continuing to take aggressive actions as it relates to Ukraine? Can I, can I just mm -hmm. thing? In, 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 in Lucas's question, he referred yeah. to the exercise causing the Polish for, Polish uh, concern. But you're talking about when you say troops, Russian troops moving towards the border, that is something entirely separate, separate. from these military from the aviation exercise, correct? That is entirely separate. Yes. Do we have any more? Uh, one moment. Do we have any more in Ukraine? Go ahead. Go ahead, Arshad. Maybe if I if I missed this, but were you asked about um, the? Uh, Russian media reports saying that Russia is considering barring uh, European airlines from flying over its territory, from flying over Siberia, I think, to go to Russia, to go to the Far East? Well, I think um, if Russia doesn't like the sanctions uh, that have been imposed and the uh, impact they've had, um, then the more productive response would be for Russia to stop sending arms and fighters into Ukraine. Um, and that, we feel, is the more appropriate response they could take. But does, does it bother you that they seem to be considering retaliation? Uh, well, I think, uh, sure, but I think our view is that if they want to bring an end to the sanctions, there are clear steps they can take, clear a clear path they can take. Well, but, uh, I mean, you, <clears throat> you're, you're approaching this with the idea that they want an end to the sanctions. Are you convinced that they do? They certainly don't have, they certainly haven't been acting that way, have they? Well, Matt, I think, again, because the pain has been building and we've seen the impact on the economy only growing over the course of the last several weeks. Uh, we think, uh, you know, there are serious or serious um, decisions that President Putin will need to make. As far as these sanctions are concerned, if the U.S. is asking any other countries not to do business with Russia? Well, I think, uh, Goyle, you've probably seen a, a range of sanctions that have been put in place by not just the EU, uh, but the Japanese recently put in place some sanctions. Uh, so there has been a strong response from the international community. Uh, Lucas, go ahead. Mexico, so on, uh, sure. Sergeant Tamarisi's mm -hmm. uh, trial ongoing. Um, during the trial, there's not a single member of the public or the media that's been allowed into the briefing room. Does the United States government have an issue with that? Well, let me first um, see if I can give you just a brief update while I have the opportunity. A uh, consular officer uh, attended uh, Mr. Tamarisi's August 4th hearing. Uh, they have, uh, consular officers have visited him 20, 20 times, sorry, since his arrest on March 31st. 
31st. Uh, four witnesses testified yesterday, two customs officials and two military officials. Uh, there are no more hearings currently scheduled. Uh, broadly speaking, Lucas, uh, while in a foreign country, a U.S. citizen is subject to the country's laws. Uh, we believe that he is being afforded all appropriate due process. Uh, we'd af appoint you and refer you to the Mexican authorities for more information about why the court proceedings are not open to the public. So you think he's getting a fair trial? Uh, again, I think uh, we just said we believe he's being afforded due process. Um, this is obviously a, a case, and his his well-being is certainly of uh, great concern to the United States, and that's why uh, we've had consular officials meet uh, visit him 20 times. But for an administration that lauds the idea of transparency, would you say that this trial is an example of that kind of transparency? Well, I think different laws are made in different countries about how they're going to handle court proceedings. But as you're well. defending the Mexican government, but wouldn't you like to see his own mother, for instance, be allowed into the courtroom to see due process, to see this trial take place? Is I that think, not unreasonable? Lucas, if we weren't as concerned as we are about his well being, and if we weren't as committed to making sure we provide uh, as extensive services as we can, we wouldn't have visited 20, him 20 times over the course of the last few months. But besides the visits, I mean, couldn't you, since Mexico is an ally of the United States, couldn't you tell the government we'd like to see, uh, you know, the courtroom open to the public or at least his family or I think cameras? we've raised this issue uh, where appropriate, including at the secretary's level, and obviously we'll continue to be engaged in the case. Uh, one on India. Uh -huh. As far as Secretary's visit to India is concerned, Madam, if he had a chance to brief the President? Uh, I think he has a usually he usually has about a weekly lunch with the president. I'm not sure or, or meeting. I'm not sure when that's scheduled. Uh, obviously, they're both very busy with the Africa summit, so I'm sure he'll have the opportunity soon. And finally, on Afghanistan, quickly. Uh, okay, and then we'll just uh, go to the while, back. Why violence still continues in Afghanistan, and what what is the future of Afghanistan after this 30 years of war and civil wars and all those? Things? Make it short. <laughs> I was going to say that's an extensive question. Um, <laughs> I think, uh, obviously, uh, Goyle, our focus now is on uh, working uh, with um, uh, our, the, the candidates and uh, the uh, election commissions to uh, see if we can come to a conclusion on this uh, process, the election audit that's ongoing. Uh, that's where our focus remains. We remain committed to the Afghan people uh, and to uh, their prosperity in the future. Let's wait, wait, wait. Do, do you have anything to add to what the Pentagon said about this incident today in which the I do not have anything to add Plus, from here. I saw a little bit of John Kirby's briefing. I think yeah. he gave uh, as extensive a comment as we can give at this point. Uh, do you know if there were any non-military Americans around, no one from the embassy who was involved or Not that nearby? I'm aware of, Matt. Obviously, we're still gathering information, but uh, if more becomes available, we can put something out to all of you as well. Um, last one for me. Mm -hmm. um, the Associated Press has this report that the U.S. government database of known or suspected terrorists has doubled in size in recent years, and I was wondering, is that due to uh, the uh, uh, superior United States um, IT complex, or is it because you see terrorism growing? It's a good question, Lucas. I haven't taken a close look at that. Um, I can, we can connect you with our uh, experts in our CT Bureau and get you a more extensive answer. Let's Thank do last you. one right here. Go ahead. Um, about the islands that I had asked since Friday. Yes, I do have an answer for you. Thank you. Um, the Japanese government has notified us that it has named these islands and noted that this does not represent a change or expansion of Japan's territorial or maritime claims. Uh, we'd certainly refer you to them. Uh, just it's worth restating that the United States does not take a position on the underlying question of the ultimate sovereignty of the Senkaku Islands. Go ahead. Are you concerned that this raises tension in the, uh, in the region? Do you think that the Japanese should not have done this? Do you think uh, this I is don't think I expressed that concern, so okay. I think it's safe to say <laughs> I would Thanks, not express Jen. it. Yeah. Thanks, everyone.